Okay, okay. Let me try it one more time here. And now I can't seem to get back to my. Sorry, I apologize. I'm trying to get back to my sharing of the screen. I wish you could all see what I see on my screen. <laughs> User friendly. Sorry, Kirsten. Maybe Do you, you want can... me to share my screen? I've got the. Yeah, the yeah. Go ahead and share screen. your screen. Thank you. I just, I can't find my sharing of the screen anymore. So. That should be coming up now for everyone, hopefully. I'm just going to start the slideshow. Thank you. And yeah, here hey. we go. <laughs> so, before we dive into the heart of the presentation, I'd just like to share a few words about TSEAS in general. Um, the Technical Subcommittee on Encoded Archival Standards of the Society of American Archivists Standards Committee is responsible for the ongoing maintenance of EAD and EACCPF, including all schemas and related code, as well as the development of future um, standards. Go to the next slide. Oops. Um, there's, you know, a, a lot of ways that you can learn about, um, what this group is doing, um, and you can contact members of the sub subcommittee, um, directly. We have mailing lists, we have GitHub, uh, publications. Um, and 1 thing that I, I failed to mention, which I think is important is that this is a pretty big group. Um, the, the, the really great thing I, we, we have a lot of members. Um, that are both, you know, in the United States and international. So, 1 thing is to keep in mind as we're kind of moving through these, this presentation is to understand that there are a lot of, um, you know, voices that are participating in these discussions um, and you can be 1 of those voices. So, just kind of keeping in mind that it is not just, you know, US focused, um, but it, there's a lot of individuals participating on this. the next slide. Um, and because of the needs of our community um, move fast, uh, the guidelines set by SA required standards be reviewed every five years for potential revision. Um, the standards committee, as I mentioned, is the parent committee of TAS, um, EAS and is responsible for initiating and facilitating the development of standards. And TAS, EAS must seek out the committee's approval before moving forward with any revision, whether it is major or minor. So this brings us to the current major revision of EAD, and I'm going to pass the remainder of the presentation on to Kirsten. Okay. Thank you very much, Mary, for the introduction, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, as Mary said, this presentation is part of our work on the major revision of EAD. And I would like to start us with just a quick look at the overall timeline of that major revision. Uh, we submitted EAD for revision um, end of 2020. So uh, after the confirmation that we can move forward with this, uh, we dedicated 2021 to getting a better understanding of the status quo, specifically with regard to the circumstance that we have two current slash previous versions of EAD, which are still both in parallel heavily used throughout the community. And we wanted to get a better feel of how that impacts the revision that we were embarking on. Uh, the following year, 2022, was then dedicated to specifically look at how we can best align the new version of EED with EACCPF 2.0, which was published in 2022 in August. Um, and that also followed the line uh, with the exploration that TSES is currently doing with regard to standards for function. Uh, so you might have seen uh, on different channels that there's also currently some information out for uh, the EACF or however we end up calling it uh, in terms of uh, a call for comments on the general 
um, suggestion of having a third encoded archival standard next to EAD and ECCPF. And then 2023 was the year where we specifically looked at um, contexts and concepts that are pure EAD um, elements, so to say, um, and that essentially kind of led us to the draft that has been published earlier this year um, and to the presentation um, documents that we are now talking about. Um, so this year is mainly concentrating on the call for comments, on reviewing feedback. Um, we might have a second uh, call for comments cycle towards the end of this year. Um, and along with that, we will start finalizing EAD, putting everything together that we need for submission to SAA. Um, that's standards committee that uh, Mary already mentioned um, as our first instance, but then uh, following ideally the approval of standards, um, it will also need to go to SA Council before being officially adopted as a new version. And if we go through all of that uh, without too many issues, uh, we hope to publish ED 4.0 uh, in Q3 next year. The call for comments is currently still open, um, so you still have time to provide us your feedback. Uh, we will talk a little bit about how that can be done in the next two slides, uh, but I wanted to first point you to essentially kind of two locations where we gathering all that is important for the revision and for the call for comments. Uh, and we I have on the one hand um, put everything on our SAA micro, micro site. So for anyone who isn't kind of in the very technical um, context of GitHub, that you have your place on the web where you can find all the necessary information. Um, and the second part is um, our TSES GitHub page, uh, where we have the same pieces of information uploaded for your convenience in one place. So you don't have to look through all the different repositories that there are on GitHub um, and that we are working in. Um, GitHub is essentially also the main context in which we will deal with feedback um, internally. So uh, there is a possibility via the SAA website uh, or our microsite to provide uh, feedback via a web form. You can also just send us an email uh, at ts minus EAS at archivist.org. Um, or if you are on GitHub, if you are registered there, you can also create an issue directly on GitHub. Anything that isn't created on GitHub directly, we will essentially kind of take care of putting it into GitHub so that we have everything in one place once we start moving through the feedback and uh, making further decisions with regard to how that impacts um, the new version of EED that we are working on. What is currently available? Uh, we've got kind of different um, ways to present the information that we have on the new version of EAD, um, just to also kind of uh, look at the fact that we might have colleagues that are interested in this and that are uh, mainly looking at it from the descriptive point of view. We might have colleagues who are very technical and want to go right away into the schema or right away into the question of how would I need to transform my existing EAD 2002 or EAD3 files in order to get to the new version. Um, so we have some general descriptions um, which we have put into the descriptive notes blog, um, a collaboration with the colleagues from the description section. Uh, there are three blog posts out right now. Uh, we've got a fourth in preparation um, and then a fifth will follow after we had our annual meeting in August to just kind of also uh, give a little bit of an update of what happens now that the call for comments is closed and what are the next steps. We have an editorial that very generally describes the main aspects of the new version. So it's not necessarily looking at the, the change yet, but it is looking at the new version as a, as a thing for its own. Um, the document that brings in the change compared with EAD3 is the revision notes. Um, so that's both kind of text documents 
uh, both have the possibility for you to just kind of jump into whatever chapter um, you are interested in. So there's a table of content uh, at the top um, and you can go through the whole document step by step, or you can go directly into a specific piece of encoding um, that is of importance to you. Then, of course, we have the ED4 draft schema, um, and based on this, we have created two spreadsheets, um, one that looks at the transformation route. Uh, so what would I need to change uh, from EAD3 in order to get to EAD4? Um, and then the other one is looking at what effectively changes in the schema, which is slightly the same as in the transformation routes, but also slightly different because the changes in the schema, for example, also tell you all about um, optional sub elements or optional attributes that are being added, um, and those will not necessarily be ne needed in the transformation from EAD3 uh, to EAD4. Um, so that's something that you will only find in the changes in the schema. Um, and last, we have created a few example files just to kind of give a little bit of an indication of how things would look like in EAD4. As of today, uh, we already have uh, also have a draft tech library for EAD4 online in these two locations that I mentioned earlier. Um, this is only the PDF version um, and it is not yet complete. Uh, it gives you the descriptions um, and all the contextual information around sub attributes um, for each attribute in EAD4 but it does not yet include um, detailed examples for all the elements and attributes. That is something that we will continue working on. Um, you will find that some elements and attributes have examples. Most of these will be shared elements and attributes with ESC because we essentially have kind of uh, taken those descriptions from the latest version of the ESC CPF tag library and adapted them for the EED context where necessary, but essentially, as these are shared elements and attributes, um, the description uh, is basically the same for both cases. Um, so that just kind of to give you a little bit of an indication of why there might be some with um, examples and others without. Uh, we also plan to publish today the revision notes and the transformation route based on ED 2002. Uh, so you will also have that uh, available uh, for you. Uh, it will be available in the in the same places that I mentioned earlier. Um, and what we are currently working on and what will become available later on is then a draft conversion from ED3 to ED4. Um, we will first work on this and then based on that, look at the question of whether or not it makes sense to also provide a direct conversion from EAD 2002 to EAD4, or if we can kind of do that in a staged process with the already existing EAD2 to EAD3 conversion and then having the new EAD3 to EAD4 conversion on top of that. Um, but that's something that we will look at once we have the draft conversion from EAD3 settled. Um, we are also planning to extend the best practice guide, which was introduced together with ECCPF 2.0 with examples for EAD4 um, and more example files. Um, and in this context, I would also like to invite everyone of you who wants to get involved uh, to provide us with, with example files that you might have created in your context um, or anything um, that, that you might have used uh, in presentations for your own groups uh, around the new version. So um, the more we can create example files based on real life examples, the better it will be. While today is the official TSES section meeting, uh, it is also part of a series of open drop in sessions that we have run since April. Um, so alongside the call for comments. So the idea for these sessions is that they provide us with an informal way to engage with the community. Um, so each of them uh, presents a brief uh, major strand of the revision. Um, and then there will be an open mic part for questions, comments and suggestions. 
Uh, this is actually the fourth of these drop-in sessions. Uh, so we already had two sessions in May, uh, in April and May, respectively. Um, for the first one, you will already find the recording on SAA's YouTube channel. Um, that goes more into the detail uh, around the question of how can you contribute to the call for comments. So it gives you a little bit more of an explanation of how to create an issue on GitHub or how to submit something via our web form. Um, so if you're interested in, in, in contributing but are not quite sure how to do it, I recommend that you have a look at that video. Um, the second session was looking at the point of EAD becoming more interoperable. Uh, we have the PDF uh, of the slide deck in the two places that I mentioned earlier. And the same is true for the third session, which looked at the extensibility of EAD uh, and was held on the 18th of June. Um, and today's session will look at the um, concepts of sustainability, sustainability and exchangeability in the new version of EAD as we see it here at TSEES. Um, before we go into what this means in terms of changes to EAD, I just wanted to um, talk a little bit more generally about these two concepts. Um, and exchangeability was something that we, I think, probably had in mind from relatively early onwards uh, of the revision process. Um, because while we are, of course, creating archival descriptions, first and foremost, to, to manage the data that we have, um, we are also creating them in order to give access to that data, to, give, to share um, the information about the materials that we hold. So with the aspect of sharing, um, and that can kind of take different forms, there also comes the kind of requirement to a certain extent of the data that we share to be exchangeable to a certain extent. So that might be that you are simply looking at exchanging data across different systems within your own institution. So, for example, connecting a library catalog with an archives catalog. Um, it might be that you want to kind of ch share data across different departments of the same organization. So, for example, in a university's organizational network. Or it might be that you are preparing your data in order to then share it in local, regional, national or international aggregation services. All of those require you to think a little bit about how easily exchangeable and understandable your data will be in a different context. And all of this with um, what we kind of um, read out of the initial engagement with the community that we had in 2021, an increased use of the encoded archival standards as import-export formats. Um, so uh, while we know that there are still uh, a, a big a part of the community who um, does hand coding either completely or in order to kind of improve a few smaller things that the export might not deal with, um, there also is a big part where essentially kind of EAD is only what comes out of a collection management system. Um, so there's a big part of the community that doesn't necessarily have to directly engage with the EES, but still to a certain extent uses them indirectly. Um, so import-export can be just moving data to a new collection management system or update upgrading from one version to another. Um, you might be moving data from collection management to preservation systems. Um, or, as mentioned previously, uh, you might be preparing your data for external sharing. Making data exchangeable has a few benefits as we see it. Um, the first and most obvious one is that it makes it easier to move data between different systems and contexts. And it also allows your data to communicate more easily with data from other sources. Um, and a, a third aspect, and this is probably got to be the, the main point, so to say, of the uh, second part of my presentation today, is that it also increases discover, discoverability by supporting more options for linked data inclusion. So even if 
your data is not completely the same as the data from another source, um, having the possibility to connect them via something like uh, a linked open data vocabulary um, also then allows you to make those links and to work together in different contexts. The second concept that we are going to talk about a little bit today is the concept of sustainability. Um, and again, this was one of the things that we um, had in mind relatively early on from for the major revision of EAD. Um, one thing is just that, um, and Mar Mary said that in the beginning with regard to having minor and major revisions, um, the standards that we are using are continuously evolving. Um, so there is a certain necessity to be flexib flexible in order to move with that evolution. Um, and that is looking at the archival sector, looking at things like the records and context um, that was released last year. Um, it looks at related sectors, libraries, museums, um, but it might also be looking at uh, evolutions and developments in the areas of online publication and discovery more generically. Um, and the second point is looking at the aspect that um, affects TSES on the one hand, but also something that we've been hearing in our engagement with the communities from different contexts, that there is a certain move uh, from having a separate management of the encoded archival standards to having a joint management and use of them. So specifically with regard to EAD and ESCCPF, um, there is kind of increased usage of both of them next to each other. Um, and therefore making sure that they can easily speak with each other and um, going through all the things with regard to making sure that shared elements are defined in the same way in both standards so that it's easier to, to use them jointly um, was one of the big things that we also kind of followed through in the revision. Uh, and that is one thing that is also visible in how we at TSES now manage the schemas and the tech libraries. Uh, I mentioned the point about the shared elements uh, in the draft tech library already having examples while others don't. Um, and as I said, the acknowledgement of an increased number of use cases that work with both standards next to each other. So hopefully looking at the sustainability of um, the encoded archival standards and in this context specifically EED um, will help us to connect the development of EED to the latest archival concepts and models. Um, we are also looking at enabling the linking to existing external resources and vocabularies, increasing that possibility that already is there to a certain extent in EED 2002 and EED 3. Um, and thereby kind of making sure that we reuse information that already exists in other places rather than duplicating that information uh, if that is not necessary for, let's say, display or discovery reasons. Um, and on the same side, we also allow for the creation and description of richer relations, specifically with between the records and the agents. Um, if this is something that um, you want to invest time in and that makes sense to you because you have a specific use case that would support this. So what does this mean for EAD4 and how it deals with certain elements? Um, I want to just kind of briefly refer back to two of the previous open sessions that we had because the concept of being exchangeable is also very closely related to the concept of being interoperable. Um, so I recommend um, having a look at the slide deck that we used in the second open session, if you're interested in the overlap between these two concepts. Um, and the same also uh, applies to the principle of extensibility, which we talked about in the third session. Um, in today's context, extensibility specifically looks at encoding information about related entities and their relationships. Um, and this is essentially kind of how we would see it, a, a three-stage approach that you could use. So you can simply start with just naming the related entity and then you are done. 
Um, you can extend that by referring to external vocabularies with more information. So these are also the two things that are already possible in EAD3 and in EAD2002. Um, and then what is new in EAD4 is that you can at that specific place in your archival inscription, extend further on this by providing more details about the relationship between the related entity and the materials that you are describing directly in the EAD encoding. Before looking at the external links that we enable, I just briefly wanted to mention that we also have increase the possibility for internal referencing. Um, so the attribute target already exists in the previous versions of EAD, but it only exists in very specific contexts. Uh, we have now extended that use, so target is essentially available with all elements in an EAD XML file. Um, so that allows you to essentially point from any element in EAD to any other element in EAD if you want to make a relation between these two elements and the information that they hold. And this can also be done by including several other elements at the same time uh, because we have changed the, the data type of the target attribute to allow for multiple ID, IDs to be referenced. In addition to that, we are introducing three new attributes. Uh, this is following EACCPF, um, and that is following a specific requirement to be able to um, be more specific about to where certain pieces of information in the descriptions come from or who might have added them, specifically in contexts where you might have kind of differing information on the same aspect, like a date, for example. Um, so convention declaration reference, maintenance event reference, and source reference are the three new attributes. And they essentially follow the same idea as target has. So you can uh, use that uh, with all the elements in the descriptive part of EAD. Um, and it allows you to very specifically point to the ID of either a convention declaration. So if you want to just kind of mention the rule that is behind how you have, for example, phrased the name of a person, uh, you can point specifically to a maintenance event if you want to uh, clarify that a certain piece of information has been added by a specific person or by a specific process at a certain point of time. Um, and you can do the same for sources. So if you want to point specifically to where certain information in your description is coming from, then you can use the source reference uh, attribute and point to the source element in control. In terms of external referencing, um, there's essentially kind of two possibilities how to do that. Um, the first one is picking up on something that already exists in EAD 2002 and EAD 3 um, and extending that a little bit. So that's the reference um, element uh, renamed from ref uh, because we wanted that to be a little bit more specific in, in terms of the name. Um, and that is meant to be used for any, any external resources that are valuable for further reading for someone who is interested in a certain um, material. Uh, that can be analog or digital resources. So you have the possibility to um, include the linking attributes with reference and reference is available uh, as part of the mixed content model in elements such as abstract or P, um, but it also is uh, used in uh, elements in the control section, uh, like the convention declaration, local type declaration, rights declaration and source element. And then there is external referencing with regard to pointing to controlled vocabularies, thesauri, authority files, um, which is now available with nearly half of the elements in EAD4. So we've extended that significantly. Um, and in the context of the revision, we have renamed two existing attributes. So what is called identifier in EAD3 and auth file number in EAD2002, now is called value URI. Um, 
in comparison to EAD3, this is mainly to avoid confusion with the ID uh, attribute uh, that I mentioned earlier for the internal referencing. Uh, and we also have renamed the attribute source more specifically to say vocabulary source. Um, and that is following one of our design principles to avoid having an attribute and an element of the same name. And as a third attribute, we also added vocabulary source URI. So if the vocabulary, the code list, uh, the term list that you are referencing exists online, you can also include the URI to the vocabulary as a whole. Um, if it doesn't exist online and you just want to mention the vocabulary, uh, you are fine with just using vocabulary source. Before going into further detail, I just wanted to mention a few numbers with regard to the inclusion of references or URIs to vocabularies. So in ED2002, um, there are 10 elements currently um, of 144 uh, um, that allow for this. Um, in ED3, it was 16 elements of 166. And in ED4, as I mentioned, we are nearly at kind of the half breaking point. So we've got 53 elements of 119 that allow for the inclusion of references uh, to vocabulary terms. Looking at some elements more specifically, I want to start with the element relations. Um, that was introduced in ED3 as an experimental element um, and that followed ECCPF. Um, ECCPF has slightly adapted how it encodes relations version um, to some extent following the implementation that there already was in EAD3, um, but also extending on that. Um, in EAD3, relations is available directly in Archdesk and the component elements. And the idea of relations is that it allows you to encode more details about the relationship between the materials being described and other entities. So persons, organizations, uh, other resources um, or functions as kind of the most prominent examples here. So relations allow you, allows you to name those entities, but it then is also meant to actually kind of follow through with additional information on the relationship, for example, its temporal or spatial dimensions, um, and uh, maybe a descriptive note for explaining a little bit more about the relationship. In EAD4, we are kind of uh, confirming the existence, existence of relations. I think that's, that's the first thing to say. Um, and we have followed the adapted definition in ESCCPF. Um, that, for example, includes that the attribute relation type is now an element so that it can be used in multiple languages. Um, and we can also kind of uh, include um, references to different vocabularies depending on the language, if that is applicable. Uh, we have exchanged the element geog name with the more broader place element. So that allows not only for encoding the name of the place, but also allows, for example, to encode address or contact details if that is relevant. Um, and we added new elements uh, that allow you to encode the type of the related entity and the more specific role that that related entity has towards the materials being described. So, for example, if you're describing audiovisual material and want to mention an agent, uh, you are now able to more specifically say that one agent is the director and another agent is the cinematographer of that audiovisual material. Or if you're describing court records, uh, you might want to distinguish between the defendant and the plaintiff in the specific case. What is different in EAD4 compared to EAD3 that we have now integrated the relations element as a whole into specific entity elements. So elements that already represent a related entity as they stand. And I will talk you through a little bit uh, about which elements that, that are, um, instead of essentially kind of being available next to them. I think that was one of the things that made it complex in ED3 to really make use of relations, uh, that, that there was a feeling of kind of parallelity and having to kind of essentially 
duplicate information in two places if you wanted to use relations. Um, so these elements are the element form available, which is an element that integrates existing um, elements, um, DAO, DAO set, alt form avail, and origins lock. Um, other find aid, publication node, which has been renamed from bibliography, related material and separate ma material. Um, those five elements include the whole relations plural element with all its sub elements in one go. And then there are the elements agent, function, place and subject, where we already have a few of the sub elements of the singular relation element in the conceptual model for those elements anyway. So they only have been extended with the relation specific elements that were missing. So how does this look like for the element form available? As I mentioned, form available integrates four elements in EAD3 um, that encode information about different instances, so different representations or instantiations, as Rick would call it, uh, of the archival materials, including digital objects, but also copies, for example, microforms, and originals, in case the materials described are copies themselves. So with these kind of slightly different um, content models from the four original elements, coming together, uh, we also wanted to still avail, um, enable similar kind of modus operandi for each of them. So form available allows you to have a general narrative description, um, as was the case for our form avail and originals lock, and would also kind of um, function as a, a way to kind of include the descriptive node that you have available in DAO and DAO set in EAD3. Um, and in addition to that, it allows you to reference external vocabularies or code lists, um, identifying and possibly describing these instances. And it allows you with the inclusion of the relations element to be a little bit more detailed with regard to the relationship between these instances and the materials being described. And here are just some examples of how this might look like. So, this is very similar to what you might find in an existing EAD3 or EAD2002 file uh, with just simple narrative text um, in alt form avail or in originals log. Um, so this is really just kind of um, a P tag with some information about copies or instances that exist and maybe a little bit more about how you can use them. The second possibility is to include a reference to a persistent identifier plus text. Um, so in this case, um, you can see there is a handle URI given uh, that specifically refers to um, a digitized document. And in the P tag, that digitized document is being described with a little bit more information around it. And this could be in theory extended by using the relations element. So instead of having the, or either instead or in addition of having the persistent identifier identifying the digital representation in itself, uh, you might also have a case where you want to be more specific with regard to there is a JPEG version and there's a TIFF version of this digitized object. Um, and this is something that you could do with relations um, as is exemplified here. Uh, you can also see that um, there are possibilities to include URIs from vocabularies um, in, in all the different contexts. Um, so you can do that either for the entity that you're pointing to itself, but you can also do it for the relationship type if you want to kind of um, include that. Um, in theory, it would also be available for the other elements. Um, as this is just an example, we haven't really filled in everything. One note with regard to form available, because I think that's probably the most complex uh, case in all of what we are talking about today, is that conceptually, form available as being 
representative of instantiations of the materials could also be placed in parallel to the component elements that we currently have, um, rather than being treated as a child element of them, which is how ED4 has currently defined it. Um, in such a scenario, so if we had both of them in parallel, probably the physical or born digital material that is currently described in Archdesk or the C elements could itself be considered an instance of the record as well. Um, and I think that's what makes this a little bit more complex, because essentially, if we were to go down that line, that would mean that we would need to even more substantially restructure and reconceptualize how EAD currently functions. Um, and we weren't quite sure if this would be helpful in the current situation. Um, so happy to hear any comments on that. Um, or if it would be more useful to, to currently really have a possibility where ED4 can function as kind of a stepping stone, um, specifically with regard to having something around like the records and contents topology, uh, where you go right away into um, in through the OWL format um, and, and, and in, into RDF, um, which might not be where um, a big part of our community is already heading. Uh, we know there are a few uh, who um, have the capacity to already go all the way, uh, but we also know that there are a lot of people who won't be doing that for a few years. So that's why we said uh, it might be good if EAD4 can kind of lead towards that, but not require that big jump right away. form available um, there are the four elements that um, I mentioned earlier related material uh, but in the same way also other find aid publication note and separated material um, and they haven't changed that much from what you would see them do in ED 2002 and ED 3 so they keep their option to just have a general narrative description of the materials or the other finding aids or the uh, publicated works um, that you want to refer to. Um, but they also now allow you to do that referring via pointing to external vocabularies or codes. So for example, if you have assigned a digital object identifier, DOI, or an archival resource key, um, an ARC identifier, to the material, to the resources that you are linking to, um, you might also kind of just use that in related material or in the other three elements um, as applicable. Um, so this is something that wasn't possible in the previous versions. And also what wasn't possible and what we have added is that same as what I just showed you for form available, you can now go and describe the relationship between those resources that you're pointing to and the materials being described in more detail, if that is useful and if that is something that you can provide. Um, in this context, I just wanted to include a little bit of a history and overview of using reference elements. And I'm specifically speaking about the reference element as, as it stands in ED4, uh, respectively previous versions of it. Um, because for these four elements, um, there was a specific kind of angle on those reference elements. So ED2002 allows for Archref, Bigref, Xref, Ref, um, and a few other elements directly in related materials and the other three elements. Um, ED3 still allows for Archref and Bibref directly in related material, but does not include Xref anymore at all and has the ref element, so to say, only as a grandchild of related material. So you can only use it directly in P or entry or item. Uh, so you can't use it directly in related material anymore. On the other hand, um, ED 2002 allows for linking attributes in RGREF, BIPREF and REF, while ED 3 only allows for these attributes in REF. So if you wanted to point to an online archival or bibliographic reference in ED3, 
uh, meaning that you want to encode the link with the URL where people can find those uh, resources, you essentially will need to kind of include a ref element as a child element of rf and bibref. Again, a few examples for how things could be encoded in ED4. So this is a straightforward narrative text that we already had in the previous example, just a P tag with some information. Um, and then I just wanted to look specifically at the difference between having a persistent identifier and having a reference and how we envisage both of them to be used. Um, and essentially, in the context of related material, other find aid, publication note, and separated material, um, the value URI element uh, attribute that is available directly in the elements now should be reserved for persistent identifiers. So it should be reserved to something that really comes from an authorized, maintained, uh, managed code list. Um, that might be something um, internationally applicable like a DOI, uh, like in this example or an ARC. Uh, it might be some um, general uh, unique identifiers that you are using in your context, um, but it needs to be something that is really managed and that isn't just kind of assigned um, and could easily change. While if you wanted to include a reference, like in the second example, that is more looking at really general links um, that you would find online and on the web so that you can see the online resource that you are pointing to. Moving on to what we are calling the entity elements, because they are all slightly kind of elevated place in structured. Uh, I want to start with the agent element, which is probably the most prominent one amongst those. Um, the agent element integrates all elements of EAD3 and by extension also um, EAD2002 that would encode information about persons, organizations, families, and other types of agents. So that includes the origination element, that includes the repository element, but it also includes corp name, person name, Fem name, name in other contexts. Um, so this is available as a direct child element of um, Archdesk and the component elements, but it will also be used, for example, in the find aid desk context, which is the renamed file desk element, and in maintenance event um, in the control section. So all of those have the same approach to how they encode agents. The agent element itself, the only thing that is required is giving the, the agent a name. Um, and that is very similar to how these elements are set up currently in the previous versions of EAD. In addition to that, and that comes back to the extensibility aspect that I mentioned at the beginning, um, you can use the, these elements to reference external vocabularies, code lists um, that identify or possibly describe those agents a little bit closer. Um, you can include a type of agent. Uh, you can specify the role that that agent has towards the materials being described, or you can give a general type of relationship um, if suitable and um, helpful in the specific context. And additionally, you can also include temporal and spatial information about the relationship itself. Um, this is how this could look like. Uh, so this might be something that you already have in your EAD3 or EAD2002 encodings. Um, so just an example of um, the identification data area with the unit title and the unit, date, uh, unit ID. And then this is followed by now the agents, respectively agent element, where you have the name of um, a person and then a link to the LOC um, authority files. You could extend that by really including more relationship information. So, for example, being very specific that in this context, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is actually meant to be the creator of the material. 
Um, so you can give that information in the age and role element. And you can also specify that Ruth Gader Linsberg is a person with the agent type attribute. Um, and as you can see in this encoding example here, uh, both agent type and agent role also allow you to use the pointers to vocabulary. So if you are using um, a, a specific role vocabulary, um, like the mark code list, code list for relators, uh, you can point to that. Um, and uh, similarly for, for the type, um, you could, for example, point to the ontology for records and context, you could point to something else. Um, and an additional thing uh, that is illustrated with this example here is that you can also do that in multiple, multiple languages. Um, so with the possibility to point to uh, vocabularies, um, that essentially kind of give you a central or international anchor point, so to say, you can have multilingual information in your descriptions um, and still provide international accessibility. Similar to agent, we also have elevated the place element a little bit to being an entity element, uh, so that integrates all elements um, that give information about places or geographic features um, or address information. So um, EAD 2002 and EAD 3, for example, um, do use the address element as a separate element uh, from GeoGNAME in different contexts. For example, repository is one of those contexts. Um, and we wanted to bring all of this together so that we can make sure that if address information is given, um, you actually also know the name of the place that this address information belongs to. This is again available in ArchDesk and C elements, um, also in Find It Desk, and additionally in the relation element in general, where it provides the spatial dimension um, of the relationship. This is slightly more open than the agent element is. Um, so we have a group of six elements uh, and one of them needs to be present uh, for the place element. Um, that starts again with the name, uh, but it could also be just the type or the role of the place uh, towards the materials being described, uh, its geographic coordinates, address or contact details. Um, and then you have the same additional extensible, extensible options that I mentioned earlier for agent in terms of reference and vocabularies, um, giving some more encoding information directly encoded in EAD about the relationship um, and giving temporal um, dimensions of the relationship. And then there are two more elements that fall into that category, um, and that is the function element and the subject element. Uh, function, same as agent and place, is a shared element, so that also exists in ESCCPF, uh, while subject is only used in EAD. Um, however, we have decided that both um, conceptually feel relatively similar, so we have given them the same content model in the new version of EAD. So, both elements require a function or a subject term to be named. So that's similar to what I mentioned for the agent name um, and for place name being one of the elements that needs to be present when you describe a place. Um, and then again, both allow for external referencing of vocabularies. So where does this function or subject term come from? Um, and they additionally allow to you to encode the type of target entity. So if you have kind of different types of subjects or different types of functions in your description, you can kind of uh, use, use that um, for encoding this information. You can give a more specific role uh, towards the materials, or you can generally describe the relationship between the function, respectively the subject and the materials. Um, and again, both of them give a possibility to be more specific on temporal or spatial dimensions of the relationship. And with this, the main part of the presentation comes to an end. And now we've got um, half an hour for 
questions, comments, suggestions, anything um, that is applicable. So if you to... have any questions, um, sorry, Carson didn't mean that. Um, you know, you can put it in the chat or um, you can unmute yourself and uh, ask those questions. Oh, we have a question from Michelle. Um, hi, this was really interesting. Thank you so much. Good information. Um, I have a, I guess, 1, 1 statement and then 1 question. Um, you mentioned that you're considering. Uh, supporting a migration path directly from E82 to E84. Um, I haven't looked at statistics in a while, but the last time I checked the ad adoption of E83 was still kind of sparse maybe so i really hope that that's something that that you guys will pursue i think it would be great for um, institutions that didn't have the time or the expertise or the ability to go to ead3 not to sort of leave them yet further behind and, and provide that path um, so that that was my statement um, and then my question is just real real quick when you were talking about where the i think it was the relation elements were being added and you gave the proportion of elements that now include them and I believe you mentioned 144 elements for E82, 166 for E83, and 119 for E84. Am I understanding that correctly? That almost that 50 elements are being removed between E83 and E84. Is that right? Um, in terms of the numbers, yes, um, all of them, uh, apart from one exception, um, have a migration path. So they might either be kind of integrated into new elements like DAO, DAO set, um, alt form available originals log are integrated into this new form available element, um, or they might just be kind of renamed um, and therefore are kind of not existing as such anymore in the schema, so to say. Um, I see. Okay. Uh, on the whole, I think less elements is, is probably a good direction to go in um, while still supporting a place for, for the information that we want to store. So that, that answers my question. Thank you. Okay. And I think uh, just to, to pick up on your uh, comment uh, with regards to EAD 2002 conversion, um, I think that's, that's kind of is the same as as we see it uh, that um, there certainly is not that big uptake of ed3 as um, we might have wanted it to be like uh, nearly 10 years ago now um, <laughs> uh, but um, and i think the the other point while we are looking into the question of having a direct conversion from ed2002 to ed4 is also that some of the changes that happened between ed2002 and ed3 might now have a, a better way to present it in EAD4 again. Um, so that's also one of the reasons why we want to kind of look into, into this so that we don't lose something when converting EAD2002 to EAD3, which we wanted to have in EAD4, if that makes sense. And I see, thank you very much to, to Corey that um, obviously the Recordings of the second and third open session are also available on uh, the YouTube channel of SAA. So, so that's good. Thank you for including those links in the chat, Corey. Any other questions? I can't see anything in the chat, I think, at the moment. Oh. There, there's nothing in the chat, but um, just to, I wanted to take uh, this quick opportunity to um, remind uh, participants and please tell your colleagues, um, there are opportunities to join us in Chicago. As you know, the SA annual meeting is coming up in Chicago. Um, the TSEAS annual meeting is taking place uh, August 12th through August 14th. Uh, we're planning to have an open session on August 14th that will be both in person and virtual. Um, and we'll, you know, we're, we're kind of working on the agenda right now. So we hope to provide uh, more details um, soon. 
Um, the second event that is happening is that there will be a bring your own breakfast session uh, on Friday, August 16th at 8 a.m. Uh, to learn more about TSEAS in general. Um, as people may or may not be aware, unfortunately, these uh, meetings are not recorded. So this is really for people who plan to attend SAA in person. So if you are around and you feel like getting up at eight o'clock in the morning, please join. Uh, I'll be there um, and Carmen Bradenberg, my co-chair of TSA as will be there and I'm assuming Kirsten will be there as well. Um, so this is also an opportunity uh, to ask questions, uh, not just about EAD uh, for major revisions, but also um, EAD. CCPF, and if you've seen the latest version um, or the newest standard of EAF, so this is an opportunity to kind of have a one on one if you're if you're interested to uh, ask questions or learn more. So, Carson, we have a question for um, you yeah. in the chat. I don't know if you've seen it. Yeah, so uh, just reading this out loud for, for everyone and also for the recording. Um, I have a question on the use of ID and value URI. For an agent, if you use value URI to reference an agent, but you want to add an external link in the EAD file, should you add another value to ID or could you use the same value as in value URI? That's a very specific use case. Um, so if I understand that correctly, um, I, I so I mean, I, th I think I would say, so ID should always be for the internal referencing within the same EAD document. If it happens to be that you are using, um, let's say, um, a VF code uh, for the agent uh, element um, as the, the value of ID, um, then you might have such a use case where essentially kind of the value of ID and the value of value URI are identical. Um, however, I think that might be more kind of a, um, a niche use case because probably the ID attributes that you have for pointing at specific elements within the same EAD file might not necessarily pick up on external vocabularies and the identifiers used there. Uh, but in theory, um, that, that could be the case that that appears. Um, I hope that that answers the question sufficiently. Good. If there aren't any immediate questions, um, as I mentioned, um, you can always reach out via the ts es at archivists.org uh, email address uh, to us. Um, you can, you are very well invited to um, suggest any changes or um, additions to, to EAD4. Um, and as Mary mentioned, uh, you're welcome to join us. Um, either on the 14th and or on the 16th of August um, when we have our annual meetings and the bring your own breakfast session in Chicago. It looks like Connor um, also added a few uh, links. So thank you, Connor, for doing that. And if we don't have any additional questions, I'll go ahead and um, stop the recording and just on behalf of TSEAS, thank you so much for taking your time out of your busy day to uh, join us and uh, hopefully we look forward to seeing some of you at SAA. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone.